Saints Row. What a long way it's come. I don't think another series has changed its identity as much as this one. The Third Street Gang dressed in purple established as vigilantes to ruthlessly taking over the city to giant celebrities. And just like real life, commercially this was their peak. After continuing to ramp up the silliness to help distance themselves from the GTA series successfully, they did it again with Saints Row the Third, set it on a new map, and made it the most cartoony and vulgar experience possible, aka embrace the crazy fun trumps all. Although it's a bit more polarizing today, for reasons I'll get to, with 5.5 million copies sold in a year, it was popular enough to receive tons of DLC in that span, including Genki Bowl 7, Gangsters in Space, and Trouble with Clones. This was where the seeds for Saints Row 4 were planted. On April 2012, Volition announced another DLC called Enter the Dominatrix. Yes, April 1st, 2012. It appeared as an April Fool's joke at first, but it wasn't because they were actually developing it. Superpowers were one of the first things that came to mind, presumably because of the Trouble with Clones DLC, which was the best received one. Then they thought, well, that makes the Syndicate too easy to kill. What about aliens trying to invade Earth? Around that time, former Naughty Dog director Jason Rubin became THQ president and spoke in an interview about Saints Row the Third, wanting Volition to make something that was quote, not embarrassing. It was initially perceived as him not being a fan of the empty filter where the third took it to insane levels, also mentioning things like that bat were only available to them given the environment they were working in. But what he was really trying to say is that he was kind of jealous that other open world titles like Red Dead Redemption and Skyrim were receiving critical acclaim that was higher than Saints Row the Third. Producer Jim Boone would clarify that Ruben was highly supportive of where the Saints Row series was at. He just wanted to see it do better. And when he saw what the developers were creating in this Enter the Dominatrix DLC, after he asked what would happen if he gave them a little more time to come up with more in-depth ideas, he then instructed them to turn it into a full game before the next generation of consoles arrived. Even Boone admitted that during development, they didn't think about the Xbox One or PlayStation 4 because they were so focused on Saints Row 4, and that they didn't want to make a 7th gen title upscale for the next one. However, I can't help but think the real reason Jason wanted a new sequel fast is because of the state THQ were in. By by 2011, the publisher was hanging by a thin thread financially. Saints Row the Third seemed like the only real success to keep THQ's ahead above water. But unfortunately, on the same day, November 15, they also released a PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 version of the You Draw game tablet. The what? Exactly. While it did okay on the Nintendo Wii, this one bombed big time and reportedly lost THQ over $100 million thanks to 1.4 million units unsold. This is your greatest fear? Marketing gone bad? Bad? Our own IP is attacking us and you're making jokes? These things are trying to kill me! Who we'll quench your thirst, ever think of that? And it all came to a head when the publisher experienced its own version of a 2012 apocalypse the next year, filing for bankruptcy on December 19th, and were forced to sell all their IPs and licenses, including the WWE series to 2K Games, MX vs ATV to Nordic Games, who would rename themselves THQ Nordic a few years later, the upcoming South Park RPG, which would be the stick of truth to Ubisoft, and Volition Incorporated were purchased by Deep Silver. The developers were preparing for the worst. They knew they weren't going to dissolve, but they were concerned their new employers were going to change the way they do things or be turned into a support developer of some sort, that the fourth Saints Row project was in jeopardy. Fortunately, the plans remained intact, and Saints Row 4 was announced just a couple of months after being acquired by Deep Silver. But at the same time, they had a game to make, not only before these two consoles, but before Grand Theft Auto 5, which was hyped beyond belief but they didn't. Saints Row 4 was released for the PC, Xbox 360, and PlayStation 3 on August 2013, and for the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One on January 2015. So yeah, they ended up releasing it on 8th gen consoles later down the line after all. This might sound ridiculous, but this is the first Saints Row title that finally got my attention. The first one I ever heard of, most likely because it was briefly banned here, and even then it was like half a year after release because I was completely hooked to GTA 5. In fact, that series might be the sole reason why Saints Row completely slipped my mind the seventh generation. However, after my reviews of the GTA titles became popular, resulting in endless requests to review Saints Row, I played it for the first ever time in 2019. But now that I've gone from that to reviewing the final game in the series the same year, as the saying goes, better late than never. 
It is a truth universally acknowledged that every now and again a situation arises that defies explanation. And so it was with the ascension of the Third Street Saints. Just a few months after the events of the Third, Boss Pierce and Shawnee traveled to the Middle East to stop Cyrus Temple from launching a nuclear missile on Washington, D.C. The Boss was able to stop him, barely, riding the missile in midair to disable it. And five years later, the Boss is elected President of the United States, even though he's British. My character, anyway. It's Saints Row, who cares? And all the key homies act as the cabinet. But one day, just before a press conference, Aliens known as the Zin, led by Zinyak, invade Earth and capture all the homies, including the President. Then he or she wakes up in a 1950s sitcom which is too much for the President to handle, and it turns out to be a simulation. Kinsey tries to get him or her out of it, but Zinyak throws the boss into another one, Steelport but with a lot of Zin and other criminal species to make life worse than the 50s. I want them broken. Not dead. Seriously, why doesn't Zinyak just kill everyone then and there as he's trying to do towards the end of the game? Anyway, Kinsey was able to get the president out of that one too by giving him or her superpowers, and they attempt to bring back the others from this simulated hell and take control of Earth from... Let me rephrase. Get revenge on Zinyak for blowing up Earth, and use virtual steel ports to find all sorts of clues, programs, and viruses to assist them on their quest. Don't be fooled by the front cover, the President gimmick wears off after the first hour of gameplay, and you're back to being the Saints boss again, except in a spaceship. When historians look back on the fall of the Zin Empire, this will be the defining moment. An act that was supposed to demoralize, galvanized. And a course was set that the Saints could never back down from. Okay. I seriously needed a couple of days to get my head around what I just played. But that's what happens when you shift the Saints Row series from joining a vigilante gang attempting to eliminate the drugs and violence from the streets of Stillwater to taking on aliens as US president while still continuing to amp up the silliness. I don't want to sound needy or anything, but I just blew up a capital ship. You think someone could at least give me a high five? I'm sure this would have been the intention by the developers as if it was the last in the series. They asked themselves after the third, how can they go even bigger than a pulp culture? your icon. If you break it down, it makes some sense, I suppose. But I think after four games, it feels tiring to look at now. Pretty much the whole time I was playing this game confused. And no, not because of Kinsey and Matt. Ugh. Oh my god, this is the real world. I can't just waggle my fingers and, oh look, Kinsey, you wee wolves like a gun to the brush. I'm guessing that's enough. So don't be surprised if I change the topic more suddenly than I usually do when reviewing a game. A majority of characters from all the predecessors, not just the third, return in some shape or form, including the antagonist. In fact, Saints Row 2 Shawnee is a homie here. What's her problem? My problem? My problem is that I used to be you. This isn't a born again thing, is it? No, she's future you. Makes sense. With Kinsey appearing as the second main character next to the boss, which I'm fine with because I love her, and Asha, Sid, and Eddie, I mean Zinyak being the only new ones. Seriously, the Zin look like clone relatives of Eddie the Head from Iron Maiden, and also Roddy Piper because why not? I suppose Keith David counts, but he might as well be called Julius 2.0. I'm nothing like Julius. They're okay. Asha fits in with a lot of parodies throughout the story. Sid is basically a basketball-shaped clank if he was always lustful, and Zinyak's arrogant attitude irritates you in the correct villainous way. Why do you humans enjoy leaping so much? Not as much as Dane Vogel, though. The developers wanted to create a balance for players who went through the whole series with all the returning characters, antagonists, and former homies and the new because of this version of the completely bonkers. And that the only plausible way to bring them back in a storyline context is to use the sci-fi genre. Okay, firstly, if Saints Row the Third was meant to be like this minor reboot, a way to move on in the next chapter of the Saints, then why are they rehashing all their predecessors? Don't like talking about your past. Don't see the point. Who cares what I did before I joined the Saints? Just looking at these in comparison, it shows you just how much it's changed to the point of losing its identity. Maybe Julius and Saints Row 2 was right all along. What's happened to you? I woke up. With Saints Row 2, it's the perfect mix of both worlds. A very dark but funny enough time to be what I consider the best in the series. Saints Row the Third, while the ratio between outlandish and storytelling has a pendulum effect with all the neon colors, set pieces, and near cartoonish art direction, it still has enough structure to understand what's going on. Saints Row 4 feels like so many video game moments, features, and themes stitched together like Frankenstein's monster. 
I think they went just a bit too far. It's not as funny or exciting. Yeah, but it's all your fun. Making a man who risks his life for you and what you stand for the butt of your comedy routine is all in good fun? Yes. You're a terrible person. And I don't just say that in regards to the plot, but also the way it's presented. Each game continued to grow in scope and reduce in maturity. So if that's what you're putting out there, particularly in the third game, then that's what comes back. What do you do next? Especially if you're pressing for time. Well, you can't say they didn't go bigger than Steelport. So much for subtlety. Don't worry about it, honey. Subtlety is not really our thing. The sci-fi genre doesn't leave as much room to be as juvenile as Saints Row the Third. They should have at least brought back the psychotic mentality from Saints Row 2, wanting revenge against Zinyak and willing to do whatever it takes. But then again, if this game had to be censored in Australia, even with an R18 Plus rating introduced the same year it came out, the rating that helped bring in Mortal Kombat and Left 4 Dead fully uncensored, then it must have done something controversial. What the f we don't use that kind of language here in Steelport. Which means the rectifier gun and the mission psychosomatic will not appear in this review. Instead, it relies more on other pop culture references. Like, really relies on them, including movie puns, text adventures, Call of Duty, Metal Gear Solid, and probably the most obvious, Mass Effect. The second one, to be more precise. Which means I should love this. And I kinda do. This giant boss with a Saints can named Paul. This Tron Wipeout inspired charge to the Logic Gate. And and streets of rage. I know you've been here. We just have to get to the main office. Come on! It certainly provides a lot of gameplay variety, but unlike the Grand Theft Auto series which tries to be subtle with what they're imitating, like using moments that we might not remember in a long time, and appearing and disappearing quickly enough to go back to the story it's telling us. Even if the main selling point of that game is the free roaming rampage, in Saints Row 4, these parodies and satires usually last a whole quest or mission. Maybe these are what made the plot so confusing. Every character's simulated personal hell blatantly imitates some sort of video game, movie or TV. TV show, and it's too distracting from the real narrative. Recognize that place? Too right, I do. I was just a kid when I came here. Hell, I was too scared to talk back then. That must have been nice. Say again? I didn't say anything. These moments highlighting the boss's past prove my point. They're clear reminders of how much the series has changed. No wonder I'd prefer to review a series from the beginning. Imagine reviewing Saints Row 4 without looking at these titles first. So, we went from Stillwater to Stillport to the White House. And now we're on an alien ship, floating in space, hooking our minds into some computer-generated virtual simulation. That about sums it up. Yeah. I don't know if superpowers were a good or bad idea for Saints Row. It depends on your point of view. One side says it's another way to increase the insane action on screen, which is what the series is about, whilst giving you more gameplay features to mess around with. Near when you first enter Virtual Steelport, Kinsey will give you the ability to run fast and jump high enough to leap over buildings, even pretend water doesn't exist. And this combines with the standard on-foot controls from Saints Row the Third, a third-person shooter where you can use weapons, take cover, and a play just fine. My complaints about drive-by controls and lack of auto-aim seem so outdated now. What are you doing? Pretending to shoot stuff. You're easily bored, aren't you? Dunno. I'm usually too busy being awesome to be bored. However, on the other side, they didn't work on the superpower controls enough to be as good as a Batman Arkham title, for example. It doesn't control terribly. After a couple of hours, you'll always be thinking about the most efficient way to reach a marker from one side of the map to the other, especially if you've already played Saints Row the Third, and have the road and building placements in the back of your head. But that's another problem with Saints Row 4. The map of Steelport is exactly the same. No expansions, new buildings, it's not like former safe houses demolished count. And the only things that are different are some of the building names and the sky color, which is so dark I had to adjust the brightness settings, only changes if you either beat the game or bother to take over a majority of the simulation. That means 
This city isn't gonna cut me any breaks. Right. I was hoping it would be like Saints Row 2, which expands to add extra missions, activities, and turfs to take over, on top of fixing all of the other issues. But that's not the case. Which means just looking at the gameplay, the superpower controls are not designed for this map, and certainly make it feel smaller than it is. So write some code and get it working. If it was that simple, don't you think I would have done that? Never hurts to ask. This is proof that open world games shouldn't take two years to make, let alone four in the same generation. It might be because I've been playing a lot of Red Dead Redemption 2 over the last few months, but along with Grand Theft Auto 5, the attention to detail on those maps along with the missions surrounding them is astonishing. Each area, terrain, town, alleyway is used at least once throughout those games and tells another story in the process. When you look at what's been added to Saints Row 4, the alien platforms, separate levels outside the simulation, and the characters' nightmares, they don't mesh with the environment the same way. It's almost like it's forgotten that it's an open world game, there's no doubt it's the most linear of this series. Still, I'll take outlandish gameplay over clunky controls any day of the week. I can't stress how much I struggled in the first game. Otherwise, Saints Row 4 still has that cheat code, rushed feel about it. Everything you can do in Steelport outside the missions, activities, diversions, territory takeover, collectibles, alien operations, store ownership, the way it's structured is also similar to the third with the most minor of changes. Like in order to access a store, you need to hack it Bioshock style first, the operations are more likely to be on the rooftops to accommodate the superpowers, and credits are renamed cash which you can also spend on customizable stuff as well. Everything is in this hub which replaces the phone where you can access everything with the press of a few buttons including the map, experience levels, calling homies for help, and like the third, if all you want to do is complete the story, everything is optional and is there to upgrade you and your homies. Nice. Can it send Zinyak a snapshot of my ass? No. And instead of safe houses, the map has exit portals which bring you back to the spaceship where you can interact with your homies, including romance. From a rundown church to a spaceship. Damn, we ain't sure know how to pick a crib. They say the same three or four things and there are no dialogue options so it's not as deep as it sounds, however they do talk to each other when they're together during gameplay with unique conversations. I still don't believe you're real, you know. Hey. You were the one that was a crazy voice from the sky when we first met, remember? Rest assured, I had Johnny Gat with me almost the whole time after he came back. I still think having him only in the prologue in Saints Row the Third was a big mistake. The list of people killed by you is the longest I've seen in my entire career. Outside a military war zone. Hey, that list is under appeal in court. In fact, there's a lot of unique dialogue depending on which voice you select for your boss, because each one does not have an identical script. I know it was just as unique in the third, but I only realized it in this game. To the writers and the programmers who had to put it all together, good job. The developers claim players weren't a fan of the way missions were structured in the third, which affected the pacing, you didn't know which character events the story, what was considered a favor, and the quest set up for Saints Row 4 was designed to fix that. Although they improved it a little bit, I personally thought Saints Row 3 was fine the way it was simply because I wasn't forced to fill up a respect level via activities before you can enter a mission, and whatever you wore didn't affect how much you earned. That's what the upgrades are for. Now I knew the structure felt different the second I entered Steelport, but it took the last couple of missions to work out how to explain it. The primary ones are the main story missions that usually have their own level design, while the side missions always take place in either the city and or an activity. If Zinyak wants a fight, we're going to bring it to him. Taking down this simulation will wreak havoc on all the Zin systems and help us locate our friends. There's plenty you can do to overload, disrupt, and generally break the whole damn thing, so let's start small. Speaking of activities, the only additions they made were these hotspots that are basically a harder version of alien operation, these towers that require a bit of platforming skill, Professor Genki's mind over murder, club with superpowers but no weapons, platform speed, telekinesis, rifts, and the rest are the same including mayhem, virus collection, all renamed to fit with the science fiction theme this game is aiming for. Get you know. in, you can't watch it's my heart! Oh, save yourself! 
But unlike the predecessors where reaching the required milestone instantly completes a level, it uses a metal system like the race activity in Saints Row 2, where the higher you place based on points or time, the more cash you earn. Some activities are suitable enough for long time limits, but the mayhem ones don't need to be 3 minutes long. You already have 5 different versions of them, and you can't exit any time you want, which makes them nearly as boring as the first game. You can clear up later, mate. There should have been an option to exit if you're content with a bronze, since that's enough to take over the territory. I'm not discouraging others to go for the gold. In fact, the blazing activity is quite enjoyable given how many racing games I play in review. They're all clear on what you need to do, you're always going full pace, which is what makes this series fun to begin with, and they're better to do than the activities in the GTA series. I'll give them that. But I think the metal system was a trick to increase unnecessary gameplay time, and after a while, they become tedious. The only time I would do these is if they coincide with the side missions, which unlock a weapon or upgrade I'll most likely use all the time, like infinite stamina for example. Like the predecessors, the more you complete missions and activities, the more you level up, which unlocks plenty of useful upgrades, cash, weaponry and customization. It's disappointing that the spaceship isn't customizable like the predecessors. Think about what you can do with it, or imagine a ship in a cutscene that's shaped like Professor Genki's head. Maybe the developers realized it wouldn't make much of a difference because it doesn't affect how how much experience you earn. I mean, respect isn't exactly the most important thing given the predicament you and your homies are in. Instead, you can upgrade your weapon arsenal, which honestly costs too much cash for what you get. So I just put all my eggs into one basket and only seriously upgraded one weapon. The alien rifle that keeps running out of ammo. Why doesn't that surprise me? But it was very useful whenever superpower levels are being charged. And this wouldn't be a Saints Row game if you couldn't customize the way you look or what you wear. But I feel let down by this aspect this time because there are only around a dozen new hairstyles and clothes added here, as if they were part of a free update. It wouldn't surprise me if they were taken from Saints Row 2. Otherwise, it's the same as if you're customizing your player in Saints Row the 3rd, which, don't get me wrong, it's enough to give you lots of wacky outfit options. I try to combine the Saints Purple, Heavy Metal, and Superhero together. Kind of like what I've done in all but the first game. But you think for a sequel, they would have added way more customization options for your character, or at least improved what you can do with them. What they should have done was gotten rid of the vehicle customization altogether, because unless you're in the middle of a mission where you're required to drive, ride, or fly, the superpowers make them completely useless when free roaming around the map. That's my garage when I beat this game, and I never use them. At least it eliminates my complaints about falling damage and slow cars. And they clearly put a lot of focus on the superpowers because there's more to it than sprinting and jumping. Throughout the story, you learn something new. Telekinesis, Stomp, Buff, Blast. They all have different variations, which can also be upgraded with clusters scattered all over the map. And if you complete a loyalty mission with other characters, they'll have superpowers too. But since the data is so fragmented, it doesn't leave behind a complete subroutine to loop into your code base. And back to the gibberish. Ugh. It's simple. The more clusters you get, the more you can upgrade and alter your abilities. And Bob's your uncle. And of course, you still have your weapons, which I honestly prefer during combat. Only really using the superpowers to get out of a bad situation or deactivate enemy shields. And because I can never get the hang of switching powers with the D-pad, I always seem to use them by accident constantly. But that's just my way of playing this game. And I was able to beat it, so I must have been doing something right. Remember that time we had at the North? That's what I like about it. There are plenty of ways to dominate with its RPG elements on top of the insane customization options. Well, near insane customization options. They seriously could have done more. Listen to myself, I sound like Jason Rubin. Oh. 
to make sure this game isn't too easy, superpowers can only be used inside the simulation, health doesn't regenerate, instead enemies drop it like a first aid kit, and enemies can take a whole heap of punishment themselves. Well... We kill me. That said, the game is still a breeze for the most part. The first five hours is all about learning new powers. When you fall or die, you respawn immediately where you left off when free roaming, sometimes during a mission. And whenever there is a difficult moment, it has more to do with the design. Like when taking out these hotspots, not in the middle of it, but after you do, waiting for the animation to do its thing, it leaves you vulnerable to attacks for a few seconds because enemies always keep respawning. And that's particularly annoying in the grand finale. And Speaking of that, while it's an undeniably epic conclusion, using all the powers at once keeps you on your toes and ending the story on a positive note, health suddenly regenerates regularly here which meant I only needed one attempt to beat it. Like I said before, the way the superpower controls feel, the map wasn't designed to have these, so all it comes across as Saints Row the Third with cheats turned on, but the map is altered to accommodate them and has enough missions and activities, gameplay. Do you see the trend every time I mention a problem with this game? Every Everything is the result of one giant issue, that it was originally designed as a DLC, then turned into an open world game that took just over a year. Now after doing the research and realizing the situation Volition and THQ were in at the time, you can understand why they took this approach. But it's not like I released the UDraw tablet behind their back, and I certainly never bought one, meaning theoretically this accessory created this chain of THQ panicking for another hit to stay alive and cracked the whip on Volition to make another Saints Row title. So what you're left with is an expansion that overstays its welcome. A majority of the story is set in flashbacks from the predecessor with the sci-fi genre thrown in there to make it believable. The presentation, menus, customization options, and the map are identical from the third game, presumably thanks to time constraints. The superpower controls were originally designed for a DLC, you can tell just by playing it, which also contributes to the easy difficulty. And the only time it feels different is when you're doing the main quest. Outside the map on space ships, and even they feel repetitive after a while and make the game too linear. They should have called it Saints Row the 3.5. I should have realized a prison of peace would never hold a sociopath like yourself. A more of a puckish rogue. It's not a bad game, it's actually okay, certainly interesting. And sure, the second game was set on the same map as the first, but gameplay-wise it was better in every way. The third drastically changed a great deal of things, but this one doesn't feel polished or made with as much care. It's like calling Red Dead Redemption Undead Nightmare or GTA 4 episodes from Liberty City a full sequel. <laughs> Typical writer, can't stand on it. At the very least, it should have been either less than the full retail price brand new, really give consumers a reason to buy it before GTA 5, or 8th generation focused after they were acquired by Deep Silver. But with Saints Row 5 being announced very recently, we'll soon find out what Volition can truly do with the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. Considering how often the series has changed since 2006, we'll never know what the new one might look like before release. My prediction is that it's a follow-up set in a city on another planet, or even a full-size tiny planet with different alien species fighting for power. I'm not saying that's what I want, it's just my prediction. Do I like Saints Row 4? Not really. But if I wasn't a reviewer, a guy with a different job who likes playing games in their spare time, maybe my opinion would be different. The parodies increase the gameplay variety, nothing's virtually unplayable, you still have an open map with a lot of things to do, the action is just as over the top, and given how much I paid for a copy to review, the equivalent of a DLC on special, I think I got my money's worth. But overall, I mostly concur with what a lot of people say about Saints Row 4 by today's standards, just for slightly different reasons. Reasons. So let's hope this new sequel can bring things back on track for the series because it's not too late.